It's a great pleasure to welcome Ambassador Tom Pickering to Harvard and to the Future of Diplomacy Project. Ambassador, um, you've been ambassador se seven times, which I think is a record in American history. You've had a long career. We've just come through a decade that was unusual to the extent that we were so martial. We fought two big land wars in the Middle East and South Asia. Do you think in the aftermath of that and the pain and bitterness and some of the failure of that, we're going to see now a return of democracy as the focal point of how Americans interact with the rest of the world, diplomacy on point with a military in reserve, rather than the other way around? Yeah, I believe so, Nick. I think it's instructive and interesting that Secretary Rice, Secretary Clinton, and Secretary Gates have all, in fact, reminded us of the, of the, of the view that uh, diplomacy is going to occupy an increasing and important role in the U.S. I also think that the challenges ahead are not equally uh, adaptable to military solutions, as we've seen, as you, as you so nicely said. But I think that we need a much more vigorous, uh, a much better trained, a much better financed diplomacy. It's remarkable. Diplomacy is a $50 billion enterprise, including everything, including aid. Yeah. Um, American aid to the rest of the world. American yeah. aid to the rest of the world. And military is, what, 60, 70 times that. Yeah. Now, as an American diplomat, I would feel undermined if we didn't have our military. And I would feel undermined if we did not have a viable, strengthening, and leading economy. That helps. And I think it's very important. Our job as diplomats is to make sure that we never have to use that military instrument. And when we do, we have absolutely exhausted every diplomatic possibility within reason before we do. And that, in fact, our military exists to defend the United States. And that, as a substitute for diplomacy, the recent points that you noted in the last decade have not proved that it has been very useful and secondly, that there were two places where diplomacy had to play a huge role and didn't or couldn't. One of those was prior to the conflict, but the other was in dealing with all of the consequences in Iraq and Afghanistan having to do with our relationship with the population, our ability mm -hmm. to help them prosper and move ahead, and what is essentially the development function. I don't use the nation building function. I think that nation building applies creating Swiss democracies. Mm -hmm. But I think development and economic prosperity are very important elements once you get involved in the military. A great power does not leave those kinds of activities worse off than they were without paying a significant price. And our military should never be engaged in a situation where it essentially uh, ends up by being weakened and less credible. Mm -hmm. um, President Obama has um, emphasized diplomacy in much of his foreign policy, um, and that's a significant departure from, say, the 9-11 decade, the immediate aftermath of 9-11. Um, are there limits to diplomacy, uh, generally speaking? And, and what's your view on the relationship between the military and diplomacy in terms of the threat of force, sometimes, sometimes helping diplomacy, sometimes not? From your experience, where have you seen it work well, and maybe where have we made mistakes in trying to do that? Yeah, uh, I think it worked well in the Cold War. Admittedly, the Cold War was huge, but the application of a doctrine of deterrence, and then the ability through diplomacy to turn that into a significant effort to disarm or at least control in a more stable way uh, the deterrent forces on both sides and the help that that provided us in deterring a Soviet conventional attack in Europe were enormously important. And that was the synergy between military forces and diplomacy. Um, I think that in several small uses of military force on an option basis, on a choice basis. Uh, Bosnia, 1995. Yes, for but let's say Grenada, Grenada and Grenada. Panama. Yeah. Okay. But they did not involve long involvement. They were small and discreet. Uh, they did not require a huge amount of diplomacy. Uh, and one can say, OK, not bad. I'm not saying no wars. But I'm saying increasingly we're getting into a position, particularly when you get to scale, that we ought to be very careful about what we're getting into. 
I think the warnings that uh, Colin Powell gave and that others about an exit strategy and about having sufficient force on the ground so that we can move are very important. But even with sufficient force on the ground, you and I know that picking up the pieces afterward has become a huge and very entangling mm -hmm. and very difficult issue. And I have to tell you, and I wouldn't have said this to anybody before, but if I had a choice between the last decade without our invasion of Iraq and Saddam and the alternative, I think it's probably a close run thing, but I could live with Saddam. Thank you very much. So speaking of that, the neighbor of Iraq, Iran. You've spent a lot of time thinking about Iran, its tragic history with the United States. And that's the right word for it. We don't it talk is, to each no. other. You've, th you've thought a lot about how we might use diplomacy to get to the negotiating table and then perhaps at some point gain an agreement. How difficult is that going to be? And what would you advise President Obama to do, given what he and both he and President Bush have tried now for the last six years? Yeah, I think it's hugely difficult. I don't think it's uniquely the fault of the United States, but as you know, I think that we have failed to do things that we might have done better, including persistence at the negotiating table. I think Iran has also made its mistakes. Uh, my own feeling is that the trust is not going to improve by sanctions alone and military pressure alone. That misunderstanding is the source of much of the mistrust. Mm -hmm. That we need to find perhaps a viable intermediary who can begin the process of testing both sides as to where they might go. Uh, I was hesitant to nominate anybody, but you and I have had so much experience with India and that India enjoys a better relationship with Iran than most. Yes. A and India enjoys many, much through your work a much better relationship with the United States. India is, of course, facing next year an electoral change. But if we could find somebody in India who could, in fact, begin a process of a quiet shuttle, that, in my view, might be worth looking at. And you and I can think of some names of very competent Indians who now have the trust and confidence of the United States who could also have the trust and confidence of Iran. And the first thing they would have to establish is, do I, as a neutral intermediary, believe these two people are serious? Mm -hmm. Once that's done... Am I speaking to people with authority to make decisions absolutely. as well? They have to. The top. Yep. And then they have to, then each of us has to field in a quiet way a team that enjoys the confidence of the top. And then we have to have on the table some of the things that I talked about today some of the areas where uh, we could put proposals forward that we're prepared to negotiate on, not proposals that we're prepared to accept or reject, take it or leave it, right. we're not moving. Right. We have to re-engage diplomacy here. So that's one way ahead. Other ways might involve uh, a P5 process. Mm -hmm. Other ways might involve Ban Ki-moon if, mm -hmm. if, if they're interested. Other mm -hmm. ways might involve other players known to have reasonable relationships with both sides. This is not you know, unique or, 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 or something that uh, there's only one way to do it. I think there are other ways to do it. But we have to find a way to get over that initial hurdle of mistrust and misunderstanding that will require somebody we both have confidence in whose view we trust and who's prepared to be totally honest. Good. Ambassador Pickering, thank you for being at Harvard Thanks, today. Nick. Thanks very much. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Good to see you.